and it's about planar graphs and that they have found a Q number. I'm not expecting you to know what a Q number is. I'm expecting you to know what a planar graph is, okay? <laughs> so let's jump into the Q business. So uh, for the Q number, we, we seek, so we are having a graph like the one on the left here, and we seek to order the vertices. This is the spine ordering, and we seek to partition the edges in so-called Qs, and the condition that a set of edges is a Q with respect to the spine ordering is that it doesn't contain any pair of nesting edges, right? So like the little configuration on the top right with UV being nested above XY, this is forbidden in a single Q, okay? So think of coloring the edges so that the color classes don't have these conflicts, and you may change the vertex ordering and so as to minimize the number of colors, okay? So the Q number is the minimum number of Qs you can find for your graph uh, where you minimize over all vertex orders. Okay. So this is an attempt for the left graph so is to find such a Q layout, and the question is, okay, this is a vertex ordering. We always read it left to right. Uh, can I put all the edges in one Q? Well, no, I can't because there is this forbidden thing. Okay, so I'm gonna need at least two Qs if I take this vertex ordering, okay? But of course, maybe I get a better vertex ordering. So let's try an uh, approach that is proved to be very useful in, in Q numbers, namely vertex orderings that are very special, which are layerings. So a layering is partitioning the vertices of the graph into layers, L1, L2, and so on. I don't care about the number of layers, but the condition is that edges are only within a layer or between consecutive layers, okay? So you can think of BFS layerings as the most prominent examples of layerings. And if we have a layering, then we usually write it like this, and then we find the total spine ordering by reading off the layering line by line. So we find the vertex ordering on each layer, and then left to right, we go through like these little errors indicate, okay. So the question is, does this vertex ordering allow for a single queue? Well, still not, because within the layer I still have these nesting things, so I should probably avoid this. Okay, so let's change it a bit. It's still the same graph, different vertex ordering. Uh, so now I don't see this, but it's still not a one queue graph, because now these nesting pairs of edges are a little bit harder to see. So for instance, here is one. Uh, so you can, Think of it as one, so like, that's why the, the name Q comes from. So processing the edges uh, going along the vertex ordering, I start with one uh, and I finish with the same one that I started first with, okay? So it's not the first in, first out property that you would like in the Q, but it's first in, last out, which is forbidden here. Okay, so that's why these two are nesting, also these two are nesting, okay. Maybe these edges inside the layer are a little bit weird, so let's try to avoid this by introducing more layers. And we don't have edges inside layers, only edges across layers, and now what is nesting? Well, now nesting is exactly crossing in this picture, okay? Remember that we read off the layers left to right, and now the one edge is started first and ended last. So these are nested edges. Well, indeed, no matter how I order the vertices of this particular graph, I'm not gonna be able to make it only in one Q because this graph actually has Q number two. Okay, good. So now we know exactly what the Q number is and uh, I assume that we know what the planar graph is, so let's go through the history. So 1991, Keith, Leighton, and Rosenberg asked whether there is a constant, universal constant C so that every planar graph has Q number at most C. And this has been open since then. Actually, a year later, Pemarajo, who, is, uh, who was a student of Heath, uh, in his thesis, suspects that the answer should be no, and he suspects that uh, a particular class of graphs, of planar graphs, namely those of Trivets 3, uh, should already be a counterexample, so they should have growing uh, Q number. Well, this has been refuted because even without planarity, having small three bits already bounds you to have a small Q number. Okay, the bound is doubly exponential, but still for fixed three bits, K, the Q number is also a constant. Uh, for planar graphs, the best that has been known is in terms of the number of vertices. So there's results from 
2013 and 15, where uh, they get into polylog upper bounds, okay? Then uh, later the Trivitz bound was improved to be singly exponential, and the next thing was last year, or actually this year, published this year, uh, where we could prove that for planar graphs we get a, a function, a polynomial function in terms of the maximum degree of the graph instead of the number of vertices, okay? And now finally what I want to present here is there is such a constant and it's at most 49, okay? So let's talk a little bit about uh, some extensions that we also prove in the paper and some consequences that uh, bounded Q number has for your graph. Uh, so some extensions include that for bounded Euler genus, you always get uh, a constant Q number. Actually, for every proper minor closed graph class, there is a constant uh, such that all the Q numbers in this graph class is at most this. And then also for some non-minor closed graph classes like GK planar graph, GK string graph, whatever this is, there is a constant. So uh, it's not only for, for minor closed graph uh, classes of graphs. Then if you have a bounded Q number, then from this you can derive, this is not our work, but uh, we just apply it here. You can derive that your graph also has a bounded track number, whatever this means. So uh, just plugging in our 49 into the existing bound, uh, we get a track number of at most six, 461 million roughly. So, but it's constant for every planar graph. And also that there is linear volume 3D grid drawings of planar graphs, which has been conjectured a long time ago. All right. But let me also get back to this uh, history storyline, uh, because here is something particular uh, happened, because since we submitted the paper, uh, there has always, uh, there has already been a lot of uh, papers that used our results actually our technique that we use to prove the bound for the Q number to uh, prove other bounds for planar graphs pretty successfully. So uh, the technique is kind of a little bit um, yeah, in these two lines, like uh, if G is planar, then G is a subgraph of H8 strong product P, whatever this means, I'm gonna tell you later. And uh, a little bit stronger is that G is a subgraph of H3, strong product P, strong product K3. Um, you're not supposed to know what this means. But it's not actually the Q number that they use in their proofs, but it's uh, the structural result for the planar graph. Okay. And what do they prove? Well, they, are, uh, they could improve the bounds on the number of colors for P-centered colorings for planar graphs. Uh, the first constant bound for non-repetitive colorings of planar graphs. Uh, they could improve the bit length of labeling schemes. Uh, they could uh, bound the track uh, number to be not 461 million, but rather 225. And also that uh, planar, they improved on the rate at which planar graphs are fractionally three depths fragile. Okay, whatever this means. Okay, so let's get into this technique. So what is exactly what we prove, what is written there in the, in the second and third line of our result? For this, we have to consider H decompositions and H partitions. So we have a big graph, which is G, there this little eight vertex graph there. And we have a small graph, which is H, which is the one on top there. And um, let's focus first on H decompositions. So what we have that the vertices of H are usually called backs in this concept. Uh, for H decompositions, we put into the bags vertices of G, okay? And it looks like this, okay? So like for in the topmost bag, there's four vertices of G, and then there's like some two or three vertices in some other bags. Vertices may reappear. For instance, here the purple one appears twice, while the red one, the number four, appears three times, okay? You usually uh, want that uh, where your vertices appear, uh, so where your vertex of G, like the four, appears in H, this induces a connected subgraph of H. This is what you usually want. And you want that every edge of G, the two endpoints appear at least once in a common bag. Okay, so this is an H decomposition of uh, a graph. And uh, you're interested in the width of this decomposition, which is the maximum size of a bag, minus one for aesthetical reasons, okay? 
And then, for instance, the most well-known parameter is the tree width of G, where you want to find an H decomposition of G, where H is a tree of minimum width. Okay, and that's exactly the tree width. Okay, let's talk about H partitions. It's similar but different. Uh, again, the vertices of H now on the right-hand side are bags, which are sets of vertices of G, but now it's a partition. So every vertex appears in exactly once in, in a bag. And the edges of G are, not within, are either within a bag or across bags, but then there must be edges of H, uh, like as supporting edges, right? So this would be an H partition of G, uh, and the width is, again, measured as the size of the bag without the minus one. Now, uh, so these are well-known concepts, but for the Q numbers, we are actually interested in layerings of the graph. So what we did, we put on top of it a layering of the graph, and we said that the width is not so much what we are worried about. What we are worried about is the layered width. And the layered width is how many vertices of each layer appear in each bag, okay? So there, then you get layered H decompositions and layered tree widths, which is known, uh, which has been known uh, before. But you also get layered widths of H partitions, which is new. Okay. And now our structural result is the following. If G is planar, then G admits an H partition of layered width L. L is a constant, so that H as constant tree widths. So it's kind of the partition and the decomposition nested in one side in, in, inside each other. So G admits a partition into H, where H admits a decomposition into a tree. Okay. Okay. And from this, from, and then you, you have these numbers like the L and the K, and from this we can derive a bound on the Q number as a function of L and K, and since these were all constants, we get a constant bound. So let me show you a little bit about the second implication, so how to get from the uh, bounded width tree partition into uh, the bounded Q number, because then we see these concepts in action. Okay, so that's the claim up there. Actually, the claim is a little bit different. If H has bounded Q number, then I say that uh, the, bound, the Q number of G is at most three times L, L is the width. Uh, times the Q number of H plus uh, a linear function in L. Okay. And the idea is, well, we need to find a Q layout. We need to find a vertex ordering of our graph. So we take the layering that is underlying this layered H partition. Okay. And we have the layered, uh, we have the H partition, so uh, the vertices of our graph G are partitioned into bags. Okay. So let's do the layering and let's do the bags. Okay, so some, each vertex appears in exactly one bag and in exactly one layer. Okay, so you basically get this grid pattern of bags versus layers. And now the final vertex ordering, well, it's clear that we wanna uh, read the layers left to right, and uh, like first layer and then second layer and so on. But in which order should we put the bags here? Well the bags are the vertices of the graph H, and we assume that H has a nice Q layout, so there's an order of the vertices of H which we can just employ here, right? So we just take the nice Q layout of H, take this as the vertex ordering for the bags, and then do this layered thing. And what we know is that the layered width is at most L, so in each cross section of a bag and the layer, there's at most L vertices and each edge either sits within the layer, across bags, within the layer, within bag, across layers, within the bag, or across layers, across bags, okay? So uh, let's get rid of all these complicated edges and just assume that like everything is full to the extent that there's L vertices in all the places where vertices can be. And we wanna assign now the cues for all the possibilities of edges that there may be, okay? And we just go through the cases. Uh, so in the same bag and the same layer, so these are little complete graphs in there, L uh, being the order of each of those, and it's very easy to, to find uh, an assignment into L over two Qs. 
And then there is same bag, different layers, so you get this uh, KLLs staggered on top of each other, and you can uh, split them into uh, stars quite easily into L, which, so uh, this gives another L cube. And then there is uh, same layer, different bags, where you follow basically now the H layout, or uh, the Q layout of H, from top, so you have an assignment into queues of the large green bulks, and you can use this, multiply with a factor of L, because now each edge is a KLL. And then there is a different bag, different layer. These actually come in two types. One that is like tilted this way, and the other one is tilted the other way, and you always need at, the, at most L times Q number of those, and this gives the desired bound. Okay, very quick, but this was kind of the impression. So I showed you how these bounded widths and layered H partitions can be used for Q numbers, so how to get these uh, things for a planar graph. So here we actually employ a very nice technique uh, of Philipchuk and Siebert's, which goes as follows. I show you layered widths one and tree widths eight, okay? So the idea is take a triangulation. Uh, we have a BFS tree that determines our layering. Uh, say the root is on the, outer, uh, on the outside. Now the goal is that we want to identify these bags, which are sets of vertices of G, so that every vertex appears in only one bag, right? And it should be layered with L, so I don't care about the size of the bag, but of each layer, I wanna see at most one vertex. So the idea is that we take vertical paths in the BFS tree, okay? So vertical path in the BFS tree is one where the distance to the root is strictly increasing along the path. So this traverses all the layers and hits each layer at most once. So these paths are suitable for our bags, okay? So the goal is to partition our graph into vertical paths so that when you contract the paths, the resulting graph has small tree widths. Okay. And uh, I know that I didn't really define tree widths, uh, and so I'm just assuming that you're a little bit familiar with tree widths, and then you could follow maybe this following uh, animation. If not, don't worry. So what we do is we proceed by induction. Uh, invariant is we have a triangulation of some simple cycle. And uh, the inner vertices are not yet partitioned, are not yet assigned to vertical paths, but the outer boundary is partitioned into some number of vertical paths and the number is between three and six, okay? This is some invariant that we maintain. Uh, for the tree decomposition, we have a bag containing exactly these up to six paths, okay? So then the first step is, well, uh, I don't like um, having more than three paths, so just let, uh, oh yeah, inside there is this um, tree, the BFS tree, where uh, our potential vertical paths for the future sit. So now I want to identify uh, pairs of those paths so that they have exactly three on the boundary. Why not? And this implies a vertex coloring of the inside, namely, through which path I have to go on my way to the root along a vertical path uh, in order to reach the root. So this gives a three vertex coloring in the inside, and this uh, satisfies uh, the conditions of Schwerner's lemma. Schwerner's lemma tells you, or you can actually prove it directly quite easily here, that there is a face which has all three colors on it. Okay, so that's the face. Actually, in this particular case, it's a unique face that has all the three colors on it. And that's the face along which we want to uh, identify the three vertical paths that lead to this face and split the instance and apply induction. That's basically it, okay? And when we split the instance and apply induction, this means in the tree decomposition, uh, this is where we have three subtrees which uh, have a common root. All right, so basically I showed you ideas of everything, uh, except that when you just plug in the numbers of what I've shown you, you don't get the 49 from the beginning, you get a 7066. Well, uh, what I didn't show you, I, you can tweak this proof to get layered with three, but three widths also three, 
since the tree width is exponential in this bound, this is beneficial for us. But still, you get only 67. Well, if you then realize that in our proof, the actual age graph that you get is planar, you can apply a very specific bound on the Q number of planar graphs of tree width 3, which then gets you down to 49. OK, thanks. Questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Again, is the decomposition stronger then? Oh, yeah, I don't know. So, I mean, this is actually interesting. Uh, for instance, this technique that you mentioned, it's also uh, going over BFS layers and so on. Uh, it's an algorithmic technique which might be very nice to be coupled with this approach to get some algorithms working, like p-test uh, for planar graphs working. I don't know. I, I haven't investigated. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a nice thought. So other questions? So just I have a curiosity. What do you think is the real uh, number? I a mean, real Q number. So I mean, there are, uh, which is the worst known, largest known example, for example? Yeah, the lower bound has been improved like last year to be five. <laughs> yeah, so it could be very small, OK. So uh, it's quite difficult to come up with examples that, uh, that need three Qs. And then it, it has been four quite a long time. And now we know it's at least five. But I don't know. Okay. I, don't know. I see. Okay, so thanks again.